It can always edit out a piece of confidential information if you realize it later, but just keep in mind that you are being recorded. What I want to do, I guess, since we have such a small group, is just go around to start with and just briefly say kind of why you're here today and why. And I, I do want to know like kind of why you chose my session off the board. So there's a lot of we're competing. I'm competing like Facebook marketing and stuff. Can you refresh stuff. my memory? What is the name of your so, session? So, right. So my name is John Reed. Uh, the session is how to change your business with content to types of content, which is the, the teaser. And I've presented on this stuff before. I am a technology journalist by trade at the moment. I work in multimedia journalism, and I'm part of a startup, I guess we could call it, called Diginomica. We're now four years in, so at some point we get to graduate from startup to, what is it like? It's a mentality, not a time. Yeah, yeah, it is a mentality. We cover issues of digital and technology change in the large enterprise segment. And so we look a lot at what companies are doing to handle everything from artificial intelligence to mobility to social media, blah, blah, blah. We look a lot at culture as well as technology because the two are kind of linked. But this talk is, is sort of inspired by all the work I've also done with local businesses over the years as well. The whole theme behind the talk is really can content help you to win more business and have more success? Has anyone used content in a way that you feel has helped your brand? Sort of. As much as it could be helped. Okay. Their brands, but I can't seem to figure out how to help myself. Okay. <laughs> so haven't helped yourself, but you have helped other people. So that's forever, something. Forever. And has anyone, I should probably raise my own hand for that one. And has anyone, does anyone credit content with obtaining new clients. Okay, so a little more than half of you. Okay, so that's a good start. So, so you guys will have some success stories to share as well. So that's an important point then. So we're talking about the use of content not only to, to build our brand, but also to help other people use content in a way that's effective. One of the key pieces here is the relationship between content and social media and the relationship between our, our websites and and the sort of destination sites that are kind of hogging a lot of the traffic and the attention right now. So that's kind of a, a key point in all this. When you say destination sites, what do you mean? The internet has primarily been become dominated by, you know, like a handful of sites that people are obsessed with, right? And that's so, what you call destination yeah. sites, like Facebook and Instagram. Right, yeah, Pe where people are spending most of their time. When I first started thinking about content, I started thinking about it in terms of how we're really in the midst of, of a lot of changes in, in, in culture based on technology, right? So the way our phones have sort of become these centerpieces and how we relate to the world is, is pretty powerful. I mean, you walk into airports and you see a bunch of teenagers, they're not talking to each other all on their phones. And, and so culture is driving a lot, of, a lot of this. And what I came to understand as an artist, which was a very hard lesson, which was sort of what I started to call the power of free, which is that whenever I try to charge for content, I had total failures. And whenever I started giving away content, I started to have sort of amazing serendipitous encounters and successes. <laughs> and the contrast was really strong. And so I started thinking about the power of free and Chris Anderson actually wrote a book about this a number of years yeah. ago. That's sort of a, if you haven't ever checked that book out, it's still worth looking at where he first started delving into this phenomenon of how essentially the digital world removes the barriers between how we can consume things, right? So right now, instead of having to go to buy a newspaper, you can go online and immediately start reading the New York Times. There's any time you introduce a barrier to content consumption, you're creating essentially friction between you and your audience. So that's something that you have to start reckoning with in terms of how you think about this. But what I came to understand is that while we call it free content, and it's important to understand like, what the dynamics of that are, it's really not free so much as a process of earning trust. So essentially, I'm when I share content, I'm giving you something that's hopefully got some soul and some integrity behind it, and it's gonna help, help you in some way. Free content isn't really free in the sense that I put a lot of effort into it, and then it's really a value exchange. If you think you're getting value out of what I'm giving you, your natural human tendency is going to be to want to engage further with that that you perceive to be valuable. So in a sense, all content is a form of value exchange between you and your audience. And that becomes very helpful because then you can start thinking about 
not just free content, but content that people might, for example, want to sign up for and think through that process of how much information will your audience give you in exchange for what you're willing to give them. One thing I'll say about a content strategy is that it's very, very powerful, but there's a couple of things that are really important to use as a baseline. And the first thing is there's some internal and business strategy work that has to get done first, right? Because in your case, for example, you're not sure you want to be in your current business anymore. So you have to figure out something about what you want to be known for before you can really use a content strategy. The big mistake that a lot of people make is sort of trying to chase the attention on social channels. The power of content is it allows you to establish yourself on social channels for what it is you do in the world, but you need to have a clear sense of what that is before you can really produce any, any kind of content that's going to engage anyone. You don't have to be a great artist. I mean, in, in a sense, we're, we're, we're competing with, with everything, right? Like, hey, when you create content, you're competing with everything from the Wall Street Journal, the Game of Thrones, to Facebook, whatever it is. So in a sense, it's you're competing with everything, but you don't have to be Game of Thrones caliber content to engage people. It's really more about people that share your passions and interests. So a big part of this exercise is, is what, what your passion is and what the focus of your business is, and hopefully linking those two together, or in some cases, helping your clients to go through that process of understanding that. Because... Most of us are smaller companies, and we're not going to be able to compete at scale with, with, with large firms. So what we can do better is find a very specialized area that we're really good at, that we really care about, and then where we can really help people and hopefully make their lives better. And content emanates from that. It emanates from a desire to connect with a community of people. They might be local, but they might not be. In my case, my community is much broader. Um, I see people at shows and stuff all over where I travel, but other people, it's more of a local connection that they're trying to foster. It doesn't really matter. Content stems into community and stems into relationships. It's not simply an exercise of, of posting content. In fact, a lot of the sites that strictly post content now and don't engage where you don't know who the people are and what they're doing, don't do as well anymore because when you read stuff, you want to find out who, what's that person about? Can I meet that person? Can I interact with them? And that type of thing. So when I talk with people about content, I encourage them to think about, it's like, ah, oh, you know, you post a blog and no one paid any attention to it. And, you know, honestly, sometimes that's true. You know, some of the best things I've ever written, people didn't pay nearly as much attention to as I felt they should. <laughs> and then sometimes I'll write stuff that I don't think is, has all that much, like, sizzle to it and people really share it and stuff. And so I don't really go by that in terms of what's valuable, but what I do is I say, if I care about a topic and I have passion for that topic, so in my case, I have a lot of passion for like media and how media is changing and stuff, and I want to be expert in that, then I'm working towards what I call topic authority. I'm trying to become better and better at that. So if I put out a piece of content and very few people engage with it, that's not necessarily the end, right? I could eventually compile those blogs into an ebook. Uh, I could turn that into a webinar. I could turn it into a slide share. You know, if, if I care about what I do, then I'm not going to, I might be discouraged the day that I put out a blog and no one cares, but I'm not going to really let that stop. Okay. So that's a really key principle. So when you think about content, you think about the fact that it actually starts with that deeper understanding of yourself and who you are in the world. That works really important. And then you think about it from a business standpoint, and there's two things that are really key. One is you got to have a tagline in your business. And, and a tagline, the way I'm using that phrase, is something that you can sort of share to explain what it is you do in a concise sentence. It's great for networking events, right? Someone asks you what you do. Claudia is the best at this. So <laughs> if someone asks you, like, you know, what do you do? Do you have, like, a sentence for us? I help smart people become outstanding authors. See, there you go. If she's interacting in a room, like she can leave someone with a clear sense of what it is she does, and they can take that with them, right? But there's something else you need, which I, which I sometimes call a narrative. And a narrative is a story that people can relate to. And I'm not actually a fan of sharing a narrative. If you put out a great film, would you tell people exactly what it was about? No, you'd want people to 
to be curious and try to understand it. And so a narrative is something that people can root for. And the more you have a sense of what your story is, the better the content process is going to be for you, right? Because that's your content hangs all over your story and starts to flesh it out. In my opinion, your, your narrative should be as bold in it and, and compelling as you can make it, like something that really lights a fire in you. So like when I think about my company, Diginomica, for example, the tech journalism company that I, that I co-own, sometimes I think of us as like, five uh, grizzled curmudgeons like disrupting tech media or you know like so we're taking on the giants you know and 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 we might not always say that but we want the spirit of that to come out in, in what we do once you once you've done that work then you can start thinking about strategy and then you can start getting to the thing i wrote about the two types of content which i want to get to because you only came to the session because you wanted to know what know. that was. So I want to I want to get to that. But before I do that, are there any uh, questions or, or comments on what we have so far? So in in general, and this this part you weren't. Uh, I don't think in the room for this, but I was talking about how ultimately content sort of connects you with community, mm -hmm. and the way the. When, when you know, like, so for example, in, in your case, if you know that there's a group of people that have a shared set of interests and passions, you, you're trying to be a part of, of their community, essentially. Um, now, every community functions differently. Like, some communities have trade shows, some have potluck dinners, but you're trying to establish expertise that's helpful to them, that makes a difference in their lives, and become a part of their community. It's through the process of of engaging with them as a community that you begin to understand what resonates with them and what doesn't. Not everything will, but if you know that there are certain things that they need, that does become a starting point. So a lot of times, you know, when I talk about, you know, beginning to think about content and, and this whole notion of the two types of content, uh, a big piece of that is there's one kind of content that's really important for businesses that I, I would almost just call it helpful content, which is what are the five, 10 most frequently asked questions that you get from your clients. That's a great starting point to start developing content. And, you know, you guys have probably had your hands full with the search engine optimization people and stuff, but you do want that stuff to be searchable to the degree that it is, right? So if, if there's certain keywords that come up in your business, you know, in Claudia's case, she's target if, romance authors are a target of late, then, you know, you know, I don't know that they are. <laughs> I guess not. But if they were, it would be like, you know, how how do romance authors get published? Or if it's nonfiction, right? Like if she's targeting a specific kind of nonfiction, you know, autobiography, then she would do a post about, about that, right? So, and you would want hopefully to have some keywords in there for search, but, but it's really more for sharing and for socializing the content. When I talked about two types of content, what I think about there is one kind is this sort of helpful content that's sort of based on frequently asked questions that you typically would get uh, in your client meetings, in your project work. The other type of content is more, I think, personality-driven, razzle-dazzle stuff. Sometimes I, I think called thought leadership, which I find a little pretentious, but it's your attempt to establish yourself as an expert. It hopefully brings a little personality. It might bring some more opinions. You don't want to be outrageous just to be outrageous per se, but if you do have strong convictions about things, you do need to put that out there. I mean, like, so for example, in our business, Diginomica, we try not to be too political, but lately with things like net neutrality and stuff, we, we kind of have to take a position. And so, so some content comes down to opinion, leadership, expertise. So those are really your two main branches of content, in my opinion. One is very, very focused on what your customer's questions are. The other is a little more focused on sort of what, who you are or who your business leaders are. It might be more than just you in some companies, but it doesn't really matter. The process is the same. Now, the one thing I wanted to say about this helpful content that I think is really important is that the helpful content is really driven by customer success stories. So if you have customer success stories, 
those become the baseline for that content. So the really hard work here is the customer use case, which is essentially documenting with the customer the entire process of, of how they met you, what you, you know, why they chose you, what you did for them, what the results were, and get their permission to publish that content, hopefully with real data in it, like you say me, 50%. I reached a new audience. With, I got my book published for the first time. Whatever it was, that result, it's a, it's a bit of a story from beginning to end. The customer case study is very powerful because when people are kicking tires on your business, they want to they wanna see what you've done for other people. The fact that someone's willing to go on the record especially if they're willing to do it on video. This is one of the real power of video. I'm actually more of an audio podcaster, which is why I'm recording the audio. But video is very powerful for testimonials because if someone's willing to get on camera and, and, and say that they had a good experience with you, that's extremely it, powerful you stuff. You don't have to say that much. Video, no. The fact that they're on video says so much. that The amount you have to say through text or audio is a little bit more because it's exactly. less of a the urn is already there when it's on video, so they can just say like five words, and that's like yep. hundred words. In, in, in fact, I've had I have one client who had a lot of luck with this because they were having a lot of trouble getting customers to agree to this, and it it does take a lot of energy and time to do a real formal case study video interview. But what they did is they hit trade shows where they knew their customers were going to be at, and they just whipped out the old flip cam, but they could have been a cell phone, and they just took little thirty second quick spots. And then they had those individual spots, but they also hired an editor to a fancier editor to add some music to it and like little quotage and stuff. And it looked really cool, yeah, yeah. but it was all based on like really, really short interviews. But there is a value if you can get someone to sit down for a longer one. The reason being that if, if they will actually speak, especially to things like numbers and results, getting someone to speak on video about the money you save them and to quantify that or, or to quantify how how you affected their business in some way is very powerful. And, and that essentially feeds your so-called helpful content. And we, we could get a little more sort of in-depth in terms of like that you want content for different phases in the so-called journey of the customer, right? So, you know, you want stuff. It, it's a little bit like a house, right? You, you don't invite people in the back right away. Front porch, you have certain kinds of content to draw people in. And then from there, it depends on kind of what they're thinking about. So that all becomes part of how you think about the power of content for your business. And that is one of the issues here is that even once you decide that you start to get religion around content, understand why it's powerful. It doesn't mean it's going to suddenly happen, right? And that's part of what you have to figure out next is who's going to create it, what the rhythm is going to be, and how do you extract content from compelling people that don't have the time to create the content. And those are tricky problems. You can solve those problems, but they're, they're problems. And uh, I've had situations where I've hooked clients up with freelance writers where essentially they interview someone for an hour, similar to what you're describing, and it becomes the basis for like four or five different shorter, shorter pieces. That person would never have written them. I mean, they, they, they say, yeah, I'll write them. But then four weeks later, you, nothing's happened. And, the yeah, so, so you have to come up with a creative way. And, and also, you have to sort of find the mediums that are, that are right for, for you in your, in your business. I mean, I, I'm using content as kind of an uh, umbrella term, but there's all kinds of things that could fall under that. I mean, you could even build a small, a small application. It might be that an interactive bot on your website qualifies for some of this stuff. There's a lot of things you can do that it's basically really content is a code word for for things I can share socially that will stand out and be interesting to my audience that will make them click on stuff and want to check me out and interact in some way hopefully. Um, What's yeah. an interactive bot? So like so for example um, thing. <laughs> so, so increasingly you're seeing the rise of messaging platforms and within those you're going to run into bots that are going to try to be helpful. Um, Alexa is a bot, I guess you could say. Okay. Amazon Alexa, oh, Google and Siri, I would consider bots. Mm -hmm. You see a little bit of the generic ones on some sites. Hi, can I help you? I yeah. noticed you were on our site you today. Chat you know, yeah, those things. Those aren't particularly interactive at this point. Those are really more to try to get They're you hooked up with very them. Very quickly. 
get a hook up with a sales yeah, rep. With the messenger but, ads. Absolutely. Yeah. Over time, they're going to get better. Like, so for example, on Facebook debuted some bots, including a CNN bot, which isn't very good. But the idea behind it that I liked was the bot would come in and say, hey, you know, what kind of content do you like? Oh, I like blah, blah, blah. Okay. Oh, here's the news stories that relate to that item. More of an interactive thing to help you find what you're looking for. The point being that there's a lot of imagination you can put into how to engage people. Um, but a lot of it comes down to what plays to your strengths and what's sustainable. And then it's really a matter of figuring out where your community lives. Um, because the fact of the matter is that in 1999, if I created an awesome website, I could probably get the people online who cared about that subject to come to my site all the time. They're not going to do that anymore, right? They're, they're on Facebook. They're on LinkedIn. They're not going to, even if they like something on my site, they're going to forget that my site even exists. That's one reason why when you go on a lot of content sites now, before you're 30 seconds in, they're bombarding you with a newsletter sign up before you've even, and, and to me, that's a gross violation of what I'm describing because what I talked about in the yeah. beginning was gradually earning trust yeah. based on a value right, exchange. Right, you automatically click close when yeah. that comes up because I haven't had a chance to see the site yet. You don't know who that yeah. person is. You don't know how good their content is, and they already want you signing up. And unfortunately, that's desperation yeah. because what they realize and what they've seen from their web stats is that most people never come back. And so they're desperate to try to get you to sign up. But the problem is that they're intervening too soon. What they need to do is, is, is give you opportunities to further engage once you get a little further down where you feel like more trust and more value. At that point, you might then share that information and that becomes incredibly valuable. So like for example, email lists, even though email, I think, I think email lists are gonna be increasingly hard to maintain for a variety of reasons, but, but they are powerful. And, and they are, it's the beginning of really acquiring data on your potential customers and, and your audience. Um, I just wanted to know what you think about introducing the option for people to subscribe when they reached a certain point on the page and you can kind of infer that they're at least a little bit interested because they actually read to a certain point. Right. So yeah, exactly. So I don't really have a problem with that in the sense that, well, it depends on how it's laid out. So if, if you, are you talking about like in the body of a blog post, for example? No, but um, but it would I'm, pop up at a certain point. Yeah, but unobtrusively and mm -hmm. politely, not like in your face, bright red, flashing. Well, you might actually want to look at my website. I'll give you my business card, my Diginomic website, because we actually, I think, I don't want to say we've conquered that problem, but <laughs> I think I think we've come up with a pretty non-obtrusive sign-up. It's still difficult because it's still cookie-based ultimately, so if someone tells it to go away on one platform, they still might see it on another, but it's not an in-your-face, like in-your-screen thing. Yeah. It, after people read to a certain point in an article, it'll come up like on, on the desktop on the right-hand side. Yeah. It's a little bit of a nudge. And I was reluctant to even do that because the thing is like, the, the thing that no one says about this is everyone will tell you, oh, if you use these interruption marketing taxes, which is what they are, they're a form of interruption, let's face it. They, it was like, oh, well, we got 50% more signups. I had a debate with this big content management expert about this because the Content Management Institute uses these interruptions. And I interviewed this guy who runs that. And he's like, oh, we get so many more subscribers. And I said, well, that might work for your business, but what you, in my business, I can't afford to alienate a small percentage of people because in my business, those people might be decision makers. And so I can't sit there and say, oh, well, I got 50% more signups, so I don't care if I pissed off 20 people. And people that are reading you know? a content management site are pretty lucky to subscribe to content because yeah. they're already on a content. And they're also, content and they're also playing, they're playing a volume game. Right. The, 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 their main line of business is their yearly conference. And so if they get double the amount of subscribers, they're going to boost their conference numbers. They don't really care if I'm sitting in a room saying, fuck right. them. And they're going to retarget everything you know. through Facebook. But, anyways, yeah. so. but, at, but at the end of the day, forgive me for jumping in on this, the no, that's great. whole reason you're getting the names is to provide mm -hmm. value to whoever the consumer and the ultimate end user is. So if you're collecting names so that you can provide them to 
people that are sponsors of your conference, for example, and you follow up six months later to see what percentage of those names actually bore fruit versus were just taking up space, that would be a good metric to follow. Yeah. You know, just testing some things. And when you were asking about how do you know what works, you test. Right. And that, that's a really important part of answer to your question that we didn't get to, which is you find out what works by trying shit. <laughs> Analytics will give you a painful view of how content performed. So make sure, we didn't cover this yet, but make sure when you launch this journey that you know what your analytical tools are and how you're going to monitor them. And that's when you're going to start to understand that when you go through things like Google Analytics or whatever tool you're using, that, an, that those type of analytics don't give you, in most cases, all the information that you need. Because unless you're in the pure media business, you're trying to use cons to convert people for other things. And so anonymous data on anonymous site visitors isn't going to help you very much. Now, Google will provide you with some demographic information like age groups and stuff like that and gender. But even that is only somewhat useful. So um, that's where the opt-in stuff comes in. And, and that's where you start thinking about HubSpot pioneered a concept called progressive sign-up, which is this notion that instead of throwing a huge form in front of someone five seconds into your relationship, or, or I hate the web and our sign-up forms that take you like 10 minutes to fill out because they want to, like there's 15 required fields. It's like just gather the... Address. Just gather the easiest, most limited amount of information you need to engage someone, knowing that your now they're part of your now they're part of your database, and you can share more stuff with them. And over time, you get to know them better. It's it, it's very similar to forming a human relationship, right? There's a lot of things that are highly inappropriate to say to someone you just met, but if you know them for six months, then that changes. And so this is the same type of concept, and I think it does work very well when you think it through. But it, it does become very important to think about. I, I say never charge for content because most businesses have much more valuable services and products that they're trying to sell. So it doesn't make sense to charge for content. But it can make sense to have sign up content. I sometimes call that free premium content, but it does make sense to have some gated content to go along with your free. Because otherwise, you're never going to. You're never going to pull out data on on who your audience is. Could you do that? Like, kind of like, uh, I'm thinking about things I actually could do. Could you have like something that stays on your site for a month, two months, however long it is, and then it's archived, and then you need to, you have like a passworded archive or for some nominal yep. fee you can get into the archive. I mean, I'm thinking. That would be a powerful thing for me, and I'm thinking that audio and video would do really well for me because my poor client base generally is stuck in traffic on the Massachusetts Turnpike right. or wherever, and if they can plug into on their iPhone and listen to me jabber about our rules or listen to me talk about substantive law or what's going on, then or watch a video of it when they're stuck at their desk. Right. Okay, so... Really good questions, and I think, I won't name the name of this company, but they're in my industry. They have something where they have this blog program where their blogs are up for like two weeks and then they go behind the gate, and I think it's crap. Well, when it goes behind the gate, it's gone in Google. You, they've lost all their search. So they, they built up search for two weeks, and then it's gone. Facebook is ruthlessly punishing sites like that now, too. Yeah, yeah. Facebook is basically deleting any site that has paid content from the algorithm. Point. Yeah, yeah. All ads. But what you can do, uh, there's there's a couple things there. One thing is that that if you write a series of blog posts, you can package them into, for example, an ebook format, and that becomes your gated content, your sign up content. So with a little bit of repackaging, you can take the exact same content and 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 re redo it. Now, in the case of video, I think you missed this part where I talked about friction creating problems, but audio wants to be free. Okay, that's, that's been pretty established. So if you provide a gate in audio, you're going to have a problem. I mean, podcasts, for example, are great. Like, I hear from people all the time on my podcasts who tell me the same thing. I'm driving. I'm exercising. I love the fact that I can do this hands-free stuff and engage with your material. But the problem is that iTunes, which is the dominant delivery medium, there's no sign up there. There's, iTunes doesn't give you crap for data, so you're not going to get data out of your podcast. But one thing you can do is you can experiment with certain things like, you know, uh, sign up to get my podcast URL or something 
on your website. Maybe you pick up some signups that way. I've seen that done on YouTube also where you want your videos on YouTube like to be free because and, and, and not private or anything because YouTube's got a powerful search engine. You guys have probably seen these stats, but I think YouTube is like the third biggest search yeah. engine in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So you load up your videos with like content and description, text description and stuff. I, I get, I mean, I get people who contact me just from this one stupid video that I put up there yeah. saying something like, uh, having a book is like the next MBA and you know, just giving them a little, it's a little teaser. Right. And people say, well, you sounded like a nice person. And then, I mean, I offer them 15 minutes of free consultation. And right, internet those, famous, and I get those calls. There you go. Yeah, and 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 Google and and Google and YouTube. What they do is when a video gets traction, it gets more traction, and it shows up on like yeah. related lists and stuff. Yeah. So you want those video content to be free on YouTube, but you, there's certain things you could do. So like one client of mine, for example, they, they turn their YouTube videos into sort of a course, and and it's just it's just a playlist. But they put that behind a wall on their website. <laughs> If you don't ask for too much information, I mean, if you ask for a whole bunch, I think, and I clicked on it and just saw YouTube videos, it might be annoying. But if you ask for, like, name and email, or, and, and then I click on that, and then I see a playlist, that's okay. No problem there. I mean, I know I could find that on YouTube anyway if I'm smart, but there are ways of doing that. The other really cool thing that's emerging that I've been thinking about, and I don't know if anyone's looked into this, is that there's more sites that are now helping you to create Internet courses and I think training courses are a super interesting form of, I wouldn't look at like charging for it, but what a cool form of content to offer people. Yeah. It's basically like an extended webinar. Yeah. And it's a way of saying webinar that doesn't scare away people who don't know what webinar means. Yeah. And it's, most people. it's evergreen. You put it up there right. and, yeah. and it's there. So right. if you're breaking up in episodes, you have more reason to drive traffic towards it over time instead of just putting front loading everything and it fades. But if you do have a real course, I mean, I mean, I have friends that um, I have clients who make around thirty thousand dollars a year off of one course that they teach. Yep, that's up. Yep, there. and you can make money off of some of that stuff if that becomes your business model. But the biggest thing that I would want to point out is that there is still somewhat of a hierarchy of content in terms of perception. Like, even if like you put out a book that doesn't sell that well, the fact that you're an author mm -hmm. matters to your clients. If you put out a training course. That's a bigger deal than a handful of blog posts. Even if the training course is basically blogs and slides you've already done, the art, the aspect of packaging that around something, it, it does raise your profile. I don't know if you found that too, but oh, you know. yeah, absolutely. And and to your point, um, you, when he talks about packaging, people will go back and say, "Well, why don't I can go to your blog and just see everything?" When you package things, you put things in order. A blog just is like you know, this information and that information, but when you package it, um, all of a sudden people want it because it makes it easier for them to access and, and use the information. It just makes an impression on people that you're a serious player in your field. I mean, because what happens is once you start packaging stuff like that, suddenly conferences ask you to give presentations, whereas before they didn't give a shit about you. You just had a blog. You know, now you can put it on Amazon Kindle, which is before you. I mean, you, you can put blogs on Kindle, but most people aren't reading blogs on Kindle; they're reading eBooks. So, and we haven't even touched on the power of live events. I mean, webinar is sort of the beginning of that, but there's also live streaming things, and live events are often the hardest to pull off because they require a lot of promotion, but they're also some of the best for building a real sense of connection and community, right? Because if it's the next best thing to being in the room with people, is interacting with them. And wait till we get to virtual reality. Right, which I've is... I've already done a couple week. of webinars yeah. in, in virtual reality. And you, you hit on something really important, too, which is that, and we, we can't talk about it today because we need to wrap up, but write a lot about curation. But it, you also form connections by sharing other people's content, which is what you did, and interacting with other people's stuff. And so identifying key experts and people in your field and sharing their stuff is a great way to begin to forge a relationship with them and it, it's all about that network of expertise that you're trying to develop and you don't have to be an expert yourself yet no, just need to know one more thing than everybody else knows exactly i <laughs> uh, also want to mention that this presentation was based on 72 articles i've written um which <laughs> yeah. which which you can browse at your leisure which i probably should package into an ebook you know the bit.ly bit.ly slash read content and read is my last name, R-E-E-D, content, and that'll take you to the link. And I'm also awesome. doing a doing a session, my next session, which is on deep work, which is a little bit different, but it's about 
how immersive creativity can change your life. Oh, you used That's, my favorite word. What's that? Immersive. Well, it's symbiotic. But well, immersive is like there the, you go. The, so if you want a little more, that's coming up. Yeah. Really good. For yep. The most, the most share. Kind of writes things in terms of buzz soon. It's it's basically yeah. you just type in the search box whatever the topic is and it shows you what the most the articles that have the most shares and most likes. Right. And most shows you what people are engaging with. Yeah. The it's most. not just this. It, it sort of erases the SEO aspect. It, it's more according to social interactions. Right. So and you can see what people actually like as opposed to what Google thinks they like. Google right. is telling you. Buzz Sumo. Yeah. Sumo? Yeah. It's Sumo Thank you. It's super easy. It's, it's, it's exactly like Googling something, except that it's, cool. it's ranked differently and it's not as twisted by You mentioned that email is getting harder to maintain, and I want to know why in like two seconds. Email, well, because inboxes are growing more crowded, and a lot of email service providers are filtering out things that are targeted as spam. Um, I think that also people getting email on their phones, they're becoming more fussy about what you send them. Because if I if I get a ping on my phone, I don't I, I, I don't want to be interrupted for like just like whatever. So I think people have to really trust you before they want to see your stuff. And so email is still very the most powerful way to like put butts in seats for things like webinars and events and stuff. But I just think that email is a limited medium. It's not a conversational medium. If you look at the next generation, they're really not on email. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, yeah. but yeah. Facebook Messenger. My son. <laughs> Facebook trying to push Messenger as the new email yeah. is basically. Like their their big concept yeah. is to basically use Messenger as a mailing list, which is whether it's gonna work or not is another question. I think it's really it's not about abandoning email but more about appreciating there could be a lot of limitations to reaching people that way. Some people still prefer it, so it depends a lot on your audience as well. Yeah. The, the key thing, though, as a marketer, is however you're trying to reach people, make sure that they can take action on what you give them somehow. Right. They don't have to. Don't have Calls to, to action, we call them. them. Yes. Some, yeah, Calls to action. Everything yep. should be a call to action. Yep. If you don't have it, you get nothing. But yeah, that's ultimately all your content is connected through calls to action, one to the next, whether it's links or, you know, again, it's about letting people get further into the pool and get and giving them a chance to easily do that. I'm so glad so. I came to your class. Did it work out? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I love it here. Uh, uh, I, I, I want to work with artists.